Welcome to The Coaching Corner, a podcast for coaches coaching in the child welfare field. I'm your host, James Coloma, and on today's episode, we'll be talking about social worker privilege. In a moment, Stephen Wells will join us on today's episode to help us under, understand more about this topic. I'm James Coloma, and we'll be right back. Welcome to the podcast, Stephen. Thank you. It's really nice being here. So for our listeners out there, tell us a little about yourself. Okay. Um, well, like I, I'm Stephen Wells, and I originally come um, from Colorado. I moved out to California in 2001, and um, I came to California with a bachelor's in psychology. Um, I ended up working for child welfare services starting in 2002, and eventually, in 2005, uh, I got my master's in counseling with the emphasis of marriage and family therapy. That was all while I was in uh, my case-carrying career in child welfare services. And um, I was a case-carrying worker in residential services and also the medically fragile unit for approximately eight years. Uh, I promoted a supervisor in 2010. Uh, worked in one of our regions uh, supervising continuing services and a court intervention unit. And then recently, I, about eight months ago or nine months ago, I started supervising the Pathways to Wellbeing unit, uh, which is uh, implementing the KDA lawsuit recommendations. Uh, that's um, uh, kind of on the child welfare side. And then also recently, in September, I became a safety organized practice coach with the academy, and I'm doing SOP coaching in Orange County. Okay, great. So today we're talking about social worker privilege. Um, first, tell us about your history with an understanding about social worker privilege. What, what brings you to talk to us around social worker privilege? Okay, um, well, safety organized practice has really engaged me in some different types of thinking about how we go about practicing social work. And um, embedded in safety organized practice and other really good social work best practices, um, we spend a lot of time talking about cultural humility and just really making sure that our practice is, is culturally uh, appropriate and sensitive. So in talking about those, those topics, we oftentimes um, address the issue of privilege. Uh, it can be white privilege, male privilege, and other types of privileges where there is a group that has um, a power that other groups don't have. Um, and they um, are oftentimes unaware of that power and how they wield that power and how that power influences relationships. And so as I've been um, working with social workers, um, it occurred to me that social workers um, not only have power, which is not a new concept, but um, they also have a privilege of, of um, how they decide to, to use that power in relationships, whether it's used constructively or whether it's used in a way that, um, that really negatively impacts um, relationships with clients. Um, and so I've been sort of developing um, my own thoughts and feelings about um, what I kind of came to describe as social worker privilege and, and just wanted to uh, come and talk to, about it today. Great. So let's talk then about how social worker privilege assists us in our job. I mean, we do, you did speak about how social workers have a power and there's a power differential between them, between a social worker and the family that are working with. How then right. do we use that to our best ability? Okay. Um, so I think the first thing that, that, all social workers need to understand is that um, no matter how great your practice is, no matter how educated you are, no matter how sensitive and empathic you approach your practice, um, you walk into a room with a family in child welfare with an automatic advantage. And that is you have the power over what happens to people and the decisions that you make and how you engage and the questions that you ask and what you place as a priority in your interaction with clients. So when you walk into a room or you knock on a door, you go into a house, um, the client or the family or the youth is automatically um, uh, under the impression and under the understanding that they, um, what they do and how they act towards you and what they say to you impacts directly the decision that you make. 
that decision can be anything as small as um, how long you're going to stay there or what questions you ask. It can be as big as whether a child is removed from their home or sent to adoptions or um, uh, where they're placed. And so they are uh, automatically uh, put in the position of having to uh, be very careful or being very judicious about the things they say and do. Um, on the other side, the social worker has a choice and has an ability to elect uh, what they do in the interaction. And the, the impact of the social worker's um, choices uh, don't impact the social worker in the same way that the choices of the family impact the family. So by understanding uh, that, by understanding that then, um, how do we either break down that barrier or work through that barrier with our families that we work with? Sure. So um, social, uh, safety organized practice uh, is really our best tool to be able to work through um, how that power differential and how that, um, I guess what we're calling social worker privilege, um, impacts the interaction. So um, when a social worker engages a family to really make sure that we are um, always aware of and controlling for that power differential and making sure to do everything that we can to engage families in a positive, collaborative uh, dialogue and discussion and to be aware of any practices that the family might see as um, paternalistic practices. Um, uh, in the sense of we need to uh, do the balanced uh, rigorous assessment that safety organized practice tells, tells us that um, it's important to do. So making sure to spend a, as much time on strengths and capacities and uh, protective actions and, um, and resources that the family has, uh, as much time on those issues as the reason why you're there or the, or the problem that you're there to talk about or investigate. To make sure to um, regard families as an expert in their own situation and to know that they generally have the answers to their own issues and a social worker's job and, and really responsibility is to just draw um, what existing information the family has to be, a, a, you know, to solve their problem rather than um, being, uh, rather than the social worker putting themselves in a uh, in a hero type of role um, where the social worker just comes in, solves problems, and expects compliance and leaves. So okay, you talked about uh, being a hero in, and, and why we shouldn't be a hero. Um, I, I always say that the term hero, moving from hero to being a host. So is that what you're speaking about? That's precisely what I'm referencing, yeah. Just the, the concept um, of, I, I am blanking on the author's name at this point, but, uh, but the concept of um, trying to be more of a facilitator. If you think of, of the quintessential host, Oprah or uh, you know, Martha Stewart, they, they set the stage, they set the conditions, they set the environment, and they let everybody be a participant in whatever's going on, it, and it's, it is not anything that's dictated to them, but they just make sure that everybody's comfortable and have what they need, and, and that is uh, a practice that um, social workers could definitely adopt and I think would help to have families feel more at ease. So what I'm understanding then is, is that first, we, do under, we, we need to understand that we are, we do have a sense of privilege and power in this, in this relationship, but that we should move away from that privilege and that power so then hosting the family in this situation and asking inquisitive questions, asking exploring questions um, right. to help us understand more about this family. Yeah, and let me, let me give an example. So we oftentimes have, um, we have lots of decision points to, to, um, to make. We have lots of uh, really important assessments and decisions in our job as social workers. And families have a lot of questions. They have a lot of anxieties and a lot of, um, a lot of things that they want to know about. And, and they oftentimes tell us that they want to be informed about things. 
So a, a typical question that a family or a parent or a youth might ask is, so when can I have unsupervised visits? Or when can I, when can I go home? My experience is a lot of times social workers are either uncomfortable or unprepared or sometimes even unwilling to address those types of questions because um, you know, social workers may say this is not the right time to talk about that. We're not here to talk about that. We're here to, you know, our meeting is about placement or our meeting is about uh, services. But, um, but that is the, the question and the topic that's important to the family right then and there. And, and that is a need that they're expressing that they, that they need to have um, addressed by the social worker. So those are the types of questions that um, a social worker that's aware of their, their sort of privilege or their power in this situation, they understand the need behind the question. They understand the need uh, and the urgency to provide that information to the social or to the, the family, excuse me. And they understand that by not answering that question, uh, it's, it's reinforcing the dynamic of that the social worker decides when that question is answered. The social worker decides when the family has access to that information. Um, and the social worker gets to sort of dictate the agenda of the interactions between the family and themselves. And so uh, for me, as somebody that would be aware of that privilege or that power that they hold, those are always questions that either the social worker would be best um, to be prepared to answer uh, or, or at least be willing to, in, to devote time and in, uh, to engage and understand the need rather than just immediately shutting down the question. Um, if for some reason, you know, social workers can't have every answer at every single time, but at least to show a willingness to engage in the conversation and seek out information if the social worker is not prepared uh, to answer the question and to be able to, to tell the family what the next steps are. As a coach for the academy then, how do you use your privilege when you're working with workers, when you're coaching workers, or when you're coaching supervisors? Yes. Um, so I want to be aware that, um, first of all, it's my responsibility as, as somebody that's a coach or somebody that's seen as um, having some expertise I want to be very aware of um, creating a supportive, safe environment for the people who are coming to me for coaching. That they that we set up really solid agreements. We um, talk about um, how social workers are. It's kind of a parallel process because I'm telling social workers the same thing that I, as a social worker, might tell a family, which is, "You're the expert. This is your work." Um, I'm not here to, to criticize or judge you. I want to learn from you. You have the answers to your own problems. I'm just here to facilitate a conversation. I'm here to host a conversation. I'm here to engage you in some critical thinking. Um, I'm here to, to hopefully leave you with something that you can take with you. Um, and so to really create the environment to be aware of changes in body language or uh, uh, making sure that everybody has time to contribute to, to the session, and just really um, being open to feedback that if something lands uh, poorly with somebody, to really explore that and take care of that relationship. Because I know that if something happens during the session that's kind of a breach in the trust or a breach in the relationship, my effectiveness as a coach is going to be impacted. So to really just show the, the caring and the kindness and the compassion as a coach uh, for the worker as I would uh, if I were sitting down with the family as well. And I think by modeling that in the coaching session um, and, and making that explicit and telling them that the, the way that we interact in the coaching session is also very similar, if not completely analogous, to the way that we interact uh, with our families, um, uh, by pointing that out, I'm hoping that it will translate to field work as well. So you talked about setting agreements and um, being open. Um, do you have any specific questions that you like to use when setting up, um, when engaging with the people that you're either coaching to or as a social worker of the families that you're working with? Yeah, it's actually, I would say it's the same question, um, whether it's a family or whether it's coaching with a worker, and that is um, what, uh, by the time that we leave here today, when we, when we have, have ended our session today, what do you hope we will have accomplished? 
what do you need from this session? What do you, what do you want to walk away with? Because my priority as far as how I run the session may not completely meet the needs of the person that I'm serving. And so I, I want to make sure to give them as open of, um, to let them set the agenda, to let them set the intended purpose of the session, whether that's the worker or the, or the family, to say, what's on your mind? What do you need today? Um, what is the focus? And then really to make sure that as I'm going through the session or as I'm going through the interaction with the client to check in at various points during, during the, the interaction to make sure that we're still on the mark, to make sure I haven't imposed my agenda on the conversation. If there's something that I need to accomplish, I'm going to be open about that and say, I have a few agenda items today that I need to talk about. Um, and, I'll, and I'll fill you in on what those are. But before we get started, before I, I tell you what my agenda is, can you please tell me what you're hoping to get accomplished today? And I think whether it's in a coaching session or, or a family interaction, um, that shows a deference, that shows um, that we're equals, that we're partners, that we're both going to have airtime, and that both of our agendas are important. That sounds great. I, um, I really appreciate the fact that you talk about being open to comments and uh, and helping to understand are we on the right direction throughout the entire engagement. Right. Um, do, you, do you also do that at the end so that if they do come back in at a future session that you know what to do differently? For sure. Um, I, I want to make sure, um, you know, at the beginning we set the purpose in the middle, we, we make adjustments if we need to, but I also, uh, it's very important to me to know um, whether whether I helped them, whether I helped advance, whether we accomplished the goal that we set in the beginning, and to take feedback, whether uh, that is feedback the next time I interact with that particular person, or it's also feedback that I can generalize to my other interactions with other social workers or other families, um, that um, I need to be aware that every coaching session that I do or every family interaction that I, that I engage in is not always guaranteed to be successful. Uh, there are going to be times where I do things awkwardly or I'm clumsy about the way I ask a question uh, or I say something that is um, unintentionally hurtful or off-putting. Uh, and I want to make sure to get that, that feedback because um, the content of the session is only a very small part of what we're, what we're doing there. Um, I'm nurturing a relationship. I'm establishing a relationship. I'm, um, I'm building trust, I'm building rapport, and so uh, if I breach the relationship sometime during the interaction, um, their likelihood of returning to me as somebody that they feel safe with and trust and, and want to work with is, is impacted. Uh, and if, I, if, I, if we run into something or, or they tell me that I have I've hurt them in some way, um, by paying attention to it and helping to repair it and hearing more about it, inquiring how I could do better or how it impacted them, um, that, I, that is going to be hopefully have an effect to heal the wound that I inflicted. Um, uh, and, and it will hopefully show them and model for them that relationships are imperfect. Sometimes ouches happen, uh, but we can get through it and we can, we can move on. It sounds to me like we're, we're talking about social worker privilege, but really we're trying to flip the privilege in the room to give the power to the family, um, and we're there as, as the uh, facilitator to getting information from them. Right. Right. And, and I think a lot of the, the kind of getting back to the privilege topic, um, what happens, the, the difference in these two scenarios, if a, if a, if a client becomes angry, if a client becomes upset, if a client raises their voice, begins cussing, um, becomes disrespectful or dismissive or shuts down, any of those behaviors are up for interpretation by the social worker. Uh, and it's our choice and we have the power and the influence about how do we characterize that? How do we document it? How do we write about it in the court report? How do we let it impact our risk assessment? Um, so one social worker may see it as, you know, an unmet need and be, and be understanding of it, and it won't have a negative impact necessarily on the direction of the case. Uh, or they may even, if they're very aware of their privilege, they may even wonder what was it about their engagement that triggered that. However, 
when a social worker acts in a way that is maybe dismissive or disrespectful or uh, maybe not as empathic uh, or collaborative as we would hope, um, it doesn't have an, the same impact. It doesn't impact livelihood. It doesn't impact whether they can parent their children. It doesn't impact um, whether they have court fees or involvement with a juvenile court. So, so that there is, is, again, an example of how that power differential, the same behavior or similar behavior impacts the client uh, infinitely more than it would impact uh, the the social worker, and so for that reason, uh, clients I think uh, are a lot more on guard about how they interact, what they say, what they do. Um, but by I think by nurturing a relationship and making making behavior okay um, with parameters, of course, um, but making you know making behavior okay and and accepting people for kind of where they're at. And creating a safe environment, um, I think that just helps to sort of balance out um, and balance out that that power differential, and also helps the client to feel more at ease that they can be more of their true self without fearing repercussions. That's a wonderful note to, to end on. Do you have anything else that you'd like to share around social work privilege? Uh, I would just say, just know that. Um, like all other types of privilege, it's not something you can extinguish fully. It's, it's something that is present because of who you are and what role you play in the client's life. Um, so it's not, it's not something to try to get rid of. It's just something to be aware of and to embrace practices like safety organized practice, signs of safety, SDM practices, uh, uh, to make sure that you are doing everything that you can to um, to balance out the relationship and to treat people um, really ultimately uh, the way that they deserve to be treated, for sure. That's great. Stephen, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us around social worker privilege. My pleasure. I, I, I know that I learned quite a bit about the privilege and the power that I have and that I wield, um, and that to be more mindful to host the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again, Stephen, and we'll be right back. You've been listening to The Coaching Corner on the Public Child Welfare Training Academy Radio through the Academy for Professional Excellence at San Diego State University School of Social Work. For more information about the Academy for Professional Excellence and the services we offer, please visit us on the web at theacademy.sdsu.edu. You can also subscribe to the Academy for Professional Excellence's YouTube channel by searching for The Academy SDSU. If you want to get a hold of us and let us know what you think about this podcast, please go to our website and click on the Contact Us button, and in the subject line, reference the title of this podcast. A special thank you to our guest, Stephen Wells, Please join us next time as we explore other topics in the child welfare arena. I'm your host, James Coloma, and now go out there and inspire and innovate our child welfare.